maybe, um, superstitious behavior. <laughs> maybe we'll get started. So it's, um, it's really fantastic to have colleagues from the Black Dog Institute. Um, I, I think many of you are aware that Black Dog is not only one of the most highly regarded mental health and wellbeing institutes in the country, but actually internationally. It has a phenomenal reputation for its uh, research and, and practice. Um, and uh, Jair is the Director of Psychological Services uh, there, so she actually has quite a big clinical load, uh, as well as conducting research, and she's been very, one of the people most responsible for bringing positive psychology into the black dog. So it's not only about treatment, it's also very much about mental health promotion uh, and well-being. And uh, Nick, who I've only just met, is a, uh, a member of the team. And just to say, my, my involvement with them goes back a few years when I, um, I had a, a part of a sabbatical working at the Black Dog, and that's where I got to, to know, you know the amazing work that it does and the amazing people. So we're very lucky to have them. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks for that intro. Hopefully this presentation won't suck. It's sort of a, a level fit <laughs> sound that I kind of tried to meet and exceeded. Um, I'm going to begin uh, with uh, a little video that we put together from the very beginning when we put Spark uh, in its very initial stages um, into, into motion. We realised from the beginning that for Spark to actually be successful, it's not just about creating it and you know, translating the research and building something and getting it out there. Um, to us, it needs to be used by people, and I think that's an area that we often miss out on in e-health, is that once it's sort of out the door, we move on to the next um, the next piece of funding we get through research. So um, maybe throughout this presentation, if you kind of just think in the frame of this being a real product that people would use, as you know, mums and dads and whoever else would use, um, the way they use any other app, that's really what we're aiming for. So. Here's a little bit of an intro for what Spark is, which we would use to um, pitch as a next, a next step. Modern life is complicated. It's busy and filled with expectations, information, and decisions. Work seeps into all aspects of it, and there's less time to switch off. We're forced to process more information and react to it even faster. And what about the constant demand in our time and attention? With so many choices bombarding us so quickly, our decision making becomes reactive. This impacts us in small ways we barely notice, like the vague dissatisfaction of a job we just fell into somehow, a job that leaves us feeling drained or uninspired, or that nagging feeling that we really should have achieved something else by the time we reach a certain birthday. Some of these little things can turn into longer term issues, like seeking to distract or numb ourselves to the things that leave us bothered or paying so much attention to past regrets, we lose perspective on what matters to us now. They might seem small by themselves, but these things look more like an epidemic when you realize that you or someone close to you will experience divorce, depression, anxiety, addiction, or alcoholism this year. So what can we do? Well, evidence shows that people better deal with the demands of modern life when they understand what uniquely motivates them. This growing body of evidence is referred to as positive psychology. Positive psychology is an area of science that studies techniques around building fulfillment in people to improve their life satisfaction. So that's why we created Spark, a framework designed to help people discover what truly matters most to them and then turn that understanding into real change of greater productivity and life fulfillment. It starts with a series of questions that you answer to uncover your unique set of values. These values are what provide the core motivations across different areas of your life. Then, once you know your values, Spark gives you practical suggestions on how to act on them. Right now, Spark is in the latest stages of development. We've piled it with a small group of people and know there is a swelling need for this type of tool. However, there is still more to do to get Spark out there and into people's hands. This is where we need your help. You can become a Spark supporter by helping us raise funds to get the app ready for market, spreading the word to others, or just staying in touch as we progress. We're committed to building the tool that helps people like you, your family, and your friends lead more fulfilled and productive lives. With your support, we believe Spark can make a massive impact. Be part of a big positive change Start supporting Spark today.
So, um, Ooh, that's, yes. Um, so where's the hat? So, yeah, I was going to say, we're not asking for your money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but that's the video that we'll be using when we, we're putting a marketing package together to go to corporates, to go to funding bodies and saying, here's what we've created, here's how it can be useful to people, here's how it ha you know, this actually affects people and you know, your customers, your employees, whatever else it might be. Um, and you give us money. So um, the point of today's presentation is I'm just going to kind of say, here's what's spark here. It's really looking at the research behind it and how we come up with the ideas and, and really um, how it fits into people's lives. And what we thought would be useful is to demonstrate that process from white papers to an actual viable product. And so I'll begin with our team um, looking very artistic. Um, <laughs> Jackie Wallace, who, who couldn't make it today, is our um, project manager. She's also a long-term employee of the Black Dog Institute, along with Vinch and I, and we've worked together closely. Uh, well, I've been there for over six years, and you and Jackie have been there for many, many years longer. Um, Jackie uh, is an absolute expert in, in um, project management, and particularly in e-health. She's been um, responsible for many of the Institute's um, e-health programs and particularly early on before that was really even much of a thing. Um, so Jackie oversees BIPAC which is our youth positive psychology intervention that I also work on and, and Vig also works on um, and more recently Spark as well. She's a real driving force behind all of it and kind of just pulls all these different things together. Um, the reason I mention that is that this team is very much multidisciplinary. There's not just researchers or just content creators. There's a huge spattering of them coming together, which is sort of what makes it quite fun, I think. I don't know if you feel it's fun, but I okay. sometimes. Um, and this is, I'll let Vijay introduce herself maybe before, uh, when it's your turn after this little bit. I don't want to get anything wrong. Um, this is me looking at a donut in. Uh, <laughs> it's actually a true story. I was very hungry that day. Um, it's the best photo I could find. Um, so I, I do a lot of different things on the team. I, across Bite Back, which is where I originally started with Black Dog, I would do, or I do things such as. Um, youth engagement, work with other organisations, a bit of develop or working with the developers, with the designers, um, content creation, that sort of thing. And with Spark, again, I've fallen into a bit of an everything role with them um, across the, all these different areas. Um, I'm not a researcher myself, but I, um, I still justify my position here somehow. Um, Matt Del Prado, his photo actually was black and white, so I can't give you a revelation colour version. Uh, Matt's our designer, and he is responsible for a lot of, well, all of the interface really for Spark and um, advising on the functionality behind it. We engaged a, a developer or a development house, which is actually more of a digital agency, but we mostly use them for development. Um, in Surrey Hills, um, and we were fortunate to have Matt who uh, gave us the internal resources for design, um, and he's also brilliant. We were also very lucky to have these guys. Uh, Dutch was a Boston University intern we had some time ago who worked across many parts of the project. Stephanie, um, who's based at UNSW, also a student, has um, been a great contribution. Um, Hannah, again from Boston, and Renat from Boston as well. And with the help of these people, Black Dog Institute, Mary A, who have funded this, History Will Be Kind, who, who worked with us on that video you just saw, and Nomad, who are our digital agency. So I'm going to pass over to Vij now, who can talk a bit about herself and the rationale for discovering the values and other researchy things. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, as Nick has told you, we are a, quite a multidisciplinary team with a, a huge skill set that we uh, bring, I think. Each, each of us individually, but I, I think I was talking to Jackie about this yesterday. I mean, even in, individually, within us individuals, we have to bring a level of flexibility and creativity and um, so tolerance and perseverance <laughs> and patience. Resilience uh, building. Resilience yeah. building, yes. So there's, a, there's a, quite a lot of skills that actually go into developing this, this particular, well, have gone into developing this, this kind of app. So as Nick said, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm the Director of Psychological Services at the Black Dog Institute. I'm also the Director of the Psychology Clinic there. So I do have a clinical, uh, I don't actually have clinical load in that sense, but I do a lot of supervision and a lot of, um, um, yeah, service interaction with other services and the, and the uh, Black Dog Institute, obviously. 
Um, but my background is in, in psychiatry. I'm a clinical psychologist, but my background is actually, I've worked all my life in the School of Psychiatry, the Faculty of Medicine, so it's very driven by psychopathology and by looking at uh, you know, what's wrong with people. So getting into this whole field of well-being and positive health, positive mental health, as it was, was quite a big change for me, quite a big departure. And I should say that Jackie and I have worked together for a very long time. So even in the time before Bite Back was developed, we recognized a need to look at prevention and um, resilience building. We saw that you know there were a lot of mental health problems, especially developing in young people, that could have been addressed perhaps at an earlier stage. Not all of them, obviously, but, but most of them. And we were very fortunate to, to get some funding and that, at that stage, at that very early stage, we started working on bike back and bike back didn't exist at all. I mean, it was just a, a thought in our mind and we put together this website, this youth website. It's taken several years and um, a lot of funding from the Department of Health and Aging to actually get it to where it is. But bike back was a, a more in some ways, a thought-through project because it was funded and we had milestones and we had to report back to the Department of Health every six months or whatever. And, you know, um, we had a team that was set up and it, everything was very, very organised. And we managed to do that, I thought, very well. But what we found when we developed Bike Back was that there were many adults that were accessing the site, partly because of our, well, partly because they were interested in positive psychology, but there was a, there was a questionnaire on that site or a series of questionnaires, but one in particular called a mental um, fitness test. Well, yeah, mental fitness test, which which is interesting because we, I mean, when we developed it, it was meant to just be a teaser to get people interested in the site. It was never actually meant to be a, you know, like a questionnaire in its own right. It was just supposed to draw people in, and was based on other questionnaires, and it was not psychometrically validated or anything, it was just a, you know, a teaser. But anyway, it, it attracts a lot of followers, a lot of people do it as it turns out. I can't remember the numbers, but it's a huge number every month. And, and many of those people were adults. And we had feedback from people saying, would it be nice if, we could did, if you did something for adults? You know, we've got this great website, but what are we, what are we doing for adults in the, that space? And we thought about it, and we thought, well, we want to do another website. We've already got the Black Dog website. And you know, it, um, and we've got bite back. So it just seems not quite the right thing to do to create a whole website on positive psychology. And also, I think it would have been out of our scope. We didn't have any funding anyway. Um, so fortunately, we did actually have a funder who was very interested in bite back, who had given us bits of money to do some research with bite back. And we pitched it to them that we would look at an app for, for adults. And we thought at that stage, I mean, we looked around and thought, you know, what aspect of positive psychology, what would we like to do, what, how would we help people move forward in their lives? And this is not pitched at people with psychopathology, but just the general, general population. And we, through a lot of debates and discussion, whatever, we came up with the idea of values. We thought, if we look at people's values, if we help people identify with their values, that might give them the compass, I suppose, that metaphor that uh, Russ Harris uses, a compass to navigate life stresses and to work up where they're heading in life and be more, be more goal-directed, but be more directed in terms of what really mattered to them. Anyway, we pitched it to Yoga Aid, and Yoga Aid were very um, encouraged and uh, very enthusiastic. I would say they were really excited by it. So they gave us a little bit of funding, just enough to get the ideas down and we pitched it again to them and said okay now we've got the ideas now we need to actually get it kind of happening and so they gave us a little bit more money to make a rudimentary app i mean i, I should say it was very rudimentary at that stage it was a very small amount of money and but we're very grateful for it because we got the ball rolling and got the momentum happening and so through that spark was more or less born um, but of course now, you know, Bike Back has the funding, a lot of other projects have funding, but Spark actually has not got any funding. So we, we actually, and that's hence this, this particular um, video, because we have to start taking, we have to develop a marketing plan for not only its development, but how it's going to be sustained over a period of time, because it, it's very much on its own, but it's a terrific 
product, as, as you will see. So just to take you through some of the thinking here, and I feel like I'm, I mean, I'm preaching to the converted, obviously, and you're all very well versed on you know, the areas that I'm going to be talking about. So rather than lecture at you, I just thought I'd present you with a bit of a rationale for our, spa, our, our app, for Spark, and then Nick can actually walk you through um, Spark because we've got it. We've got the prototypes on our phones, and we've, we've got, them connect, got it connected to. Well, we will have it connected to here, so you can actually see how it works. Now, is it the down arrow? Down, yeah, we fine. Okay. okay so, um, as you know, Wellbe has been found to be linked to the successful pursuit of life goals, and and um, it's you know the the more concordant your uh, goals uh, and values are to your interests and motives, you, you'd be able to do them basically. You feel good about it. There's a certain amount of um, positive emotion associated with working to your values, and, and that also is associated with well being. Uh, we, we are aware that um, well being increases when people choose and attain their self concordant goals, and those are the goals that fit the person. So the app that we've developed, and we've, we've kept all these concepts in mind when we were developing the app. So what we're trying to do, and I know the, the terms might seem a little bit fluffy and vague, but we're, I guess we're trying to capture fulfillment, contentment, working to your values, and trying to sort of triangulate, I suppose, towards that. So the app aims to address people's needs for fulfillment and contentment, uh, helps to bring meaning to people's lives. You know, when you look at some of the resilience literature, some of the, one of the domains they always talk about is meaning, and it's, it's a very difficult domain to actually capture and to work with as a clinician. And we're hoping, well, this app tries to uh, gravitate towards that, that particular area. Um, we know that research suggests that if, if you work to your values, if you're doing an activity that meshes with your values, you're more likely to stay with it. You're more likely to persevere in the face of adversity or life stresses or whatever, because, because you believe in whatever it is that you're, you're working on. Um, we know that the, val that the values can be expressed in emotions and in behaviours and the way we interact with the world, we reflect our values. Um, and also that there's a social uh, function with actually getting to know what your values are, because people tend to gravitate to others with similar values. Mind you, there are also people who gravitate to each other with, because they have disparate values but enjoy the, perhaps the, the, um, the discussion or the debate that might go on, but, but a recognition of different values is, is very important when you're talking about uh, social cohesion as well. Um, actually, on the, uh, I was telling Nick, uh, I was doing some reading about this app uh, uh, before, to prepare for the talk, and we, when we developed the app, one of the things we realized was that by identifying people with the same values, and originally when we, had, we were brainstorming the app, we had the grand vision that there would, be some, there would be some sort of way the app could help link up people with similar values so that they could actually um, uh, perhaps engage in activities that reflected those values for the common good, perhaps community activities or whatever. I mean, that, that really is very, very expensive to do, I think, and maybe we'll still do it, but, you know, it's not yet there. But we were sort of thinking outside the square, and we thought, well, a dating app, you know, this is a, we'd get together people with the same values, it would be a great way to get people to meet. That would be one way. But another thing that I had thought of when I was in the taxi was that um, in terms of people's political preferences and, and choices that people make when they're voting, a lot of what people vote for is actually based on their values. It's what they hold dear, what they perceive parties to reflect in terms of values. And so there's a, there's a more sinister way of <laughs> developing this app where you could actually survey some groups of voters, find out what their values are, and then tell your message to suit those values. So, you know, there were, there were other ways in which this app could be used, which were probably not, not, so, not so desirable. But one of the other things that we thought about was in organisations, in terms of team building and uh, organisations that wanted to get the best possible group of people to work on various projects or whatever, um, knowing what, what, what their values are could be quite helpful. So I've got this quote from uh, Russ Harris. So just to kind of describe it a little bit more, 
Values are like a compass, um, and a compass gives you direction, keeps you on track when you're traveling. Uh, we use them to choose the direction in which we want to move and to keep us on track as we go. And I thought that's a really nice way to describe what we're trying to do here. So there are no standard methods in the literature for helping people discover their values. Um, some uh, suggestions have been to use cards, you can use sort of card sorting tasks, there are questionnaires, um, there are you know, multiple choice type tests, there are you know, different ways of doing it basically. Um, so they can be conceptualized and measured in different ways. And what we do know about values is that, I think, is that they can also shift over time. I and mean, they're more or less stable, but they can shift over, over time depending on your, uh, your stage of life, uh, the traumas that you might have encountered. Um, uh, there's some work that's done on, uh, uh, I think, on, well, on age changes. I think uh, Schwartz did some work on that. And, um, you know, perhaps, you know, sometimes people can even work towards changing their values if, if, that, was, if that was one of their, their, their goals. Um, so, we have actually settled on the model proposed by Shalonda Schwartz. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with his work. But he is, he really has been very, very, um, um, I think, instrumental and quite a, you know, he, I, I really do respect the work that he's done. Um, he's identified 10 different values and he's actually done quite a bit of research looking at the application or the measurement of those values in different cultures. And, um, I mean, he's replicated his list of values in about 70 different countries and they still come up with the same value. So we thought we'd use his model because it's, it seems to be very stable and it seems to be consistent across uh, cultures. And so Schwartz's final list forms the basis of the development of our uh, Spark app. And Nick, I had one more slide which is not on here. You, but that's, um, oh, oh, oh really? Pass yeah, this. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Two more slides then. <laughs> So he says the 10 values are derived from three basic human motivations, and they are the biological survival needs, as you can imagine, the requisites of social interaction, or keeping things moving smoothly along in a community, and the survival and welfare needs of groups. And the 10 values, thank you, Nick, they're very nice, <laughs> are, and I've given a very sort of brief description. I mean, if you actually look at Schwartz's work, there's a lot more description for each of these values. So they are self direction. Being independent in your thought and action, uh, the quest for the value of stimulation, which is excitement, novelty, and change, hedonism, which as the name implies, is pleasure and sensual gratification. Uh, people with the uh, value of achievement would look at personal success, and that's couched within the social um, you know, community in which they live. Power is uh, social sta status and prestige, uh, control, dominance. Security is about safety, harmony, stability in relationships and stability in, in everything. Conformity is about restraint of actions, keeping up social norms, making sure everything is, you know, is, it, well, conforms, basically. Tradition is about respect for others, uh, commitment, acceptance of traditional customs. Benevolence is about preserving the welfare of the group and a universal, universalism is about understanding and protection of the group, but of nature. It's a, it's a much broader kind of construct. So with these 10, well, we call them domains, because what Schwartz did was he actually subdivided each of these domains into five values, and uh, we're ranging between three to six, and we average is about five. So we've actually adapted some of his, his material in order to put it into Spark, Purely because when you look at the factor loadings, you look at some of the analyses, some of these had less of a... They, they loaded uh, less on the, on the actual major domain that they were supposed to load on. So we kind of tweaked things a little bit to give a little bit more um, distinction. So the way we're using Schwartz's material is an adaptation. It's not directly related to it, but it is an adaptation. But it works better because when you create an app, you have to make these kind of decisions, basically. So is this for me? Oh, okay. <laughs> this wasn't mine, but I could talk to it. So basically, uh, Schwartz uh, conceptualizes this as a circle. 
and there are four major domains, and they, they uh, so openness to change is diametrically opposite to conservation, which is more the preservation of order, preservation of how things are. Uh, Self-transcendence is opposite to self-enhancement. So self-transcendence is about the universal kind of values of thinking about the environment, thinking about the world and your place and whatever. Self-enhancement is more me and me-driven. So I guess they're, they're opposite in that sense. But mind you, they're not negative. They're not, they're not meant to be negative drivers, not negative motivators. These are just descriptor, descriptors of, of um, what these values are. So what we have tried to do is capture this in the app. Now, as you notice, when you go around the circle, the ones, the, the values that are, or the, domain, the, yeah, the, the domains, I should say, that are next to each other are quite, there's, there's a gray, there's an overlap, like self-direction and stimulation, or stimulation and hedonism. Um, but when you look across that circle, there are some domains that are very opposite. So stimulation and security are very opposite each other. So some people might actually hold values in opposite domains, completely opposite domains. But most people, we think, would actually hold values that kind of hang together. But it is still possible to have completely opposite. So that's a very, very quick rundown of the rationale and the, um, the I suppose, the research evidence or the, the part that, of, of psychology that's gone into the development of Spark. So I'll hand you over to Nick, who will take you through the creation of Spark and actually show you Spark, which is a which is on on uh, his phone. Okay. Thanks, Rich. Sorry. It's a pretty interesting place to start, isn't it? When you just got that black and white stuff, and you're turning it into something that's actually tangible and usable and interesting that people might potentially pay for or you know, spend time using and. I think one of the things that's often missed in app development or in e-health development is you just go, what should it look like, what should be in it, and then go from there. And it's shocking how much, uh, how many apps out there that exist in the mental health space uh, or related fields that are in no way based upon research or have had any research done on them. It's sort of in the in the single digit percent that have. And that's like the lowest single digit percent. So in the same way that having an app without a research basis or an evaluation um, to our minds is not very helpful. Um, the guiding principle of it is really to have that transla translational model. I also think that having research that goes nowhere in the practical sense is also sort of not very helpful. So for the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes, I want to show you what that process looked like, of taking what we've just presented and turning it into what we currently have. What we began with, I'm not going to read all of this, um, but what we began with is creating these uh, fictionalized users, people who may actually use this app. And we got images of them, gave them names, showed and discussed what part of their life they're up to and what change they've recently been through and um, what they do for a living and all these sorts of things to just help flesh out and understand what the purpose of this intervention is. Um, it's not just saying we think it should do this, it's more like how can, how can the people who use it sort of speak to us and it doesn't actually exist yet. Um, so there's a lot of creative writing that was involved in this and really mulling it over and discussing what those people are and what they do. And so a bit of a theme throughout this is really a lot of life change stuff. So in this case we have um, a student facing reality during the workforce. Ooh, um, she's young and uh, you know, doing an um, arts degree. And then there's also Mitch, who's a carpenter's apprentice, whose girlfriend sort of pushing him to, you know, get more of a career happening, and um, and looking at how he would currently use technology and where he's at um, psychologically as well. Um, and uh, again, another person who um, early retirement. Uh, you know, there's empty nesters. There's people who are already seeking psychological services. There's a real a real range, and and to our mind, this is an intervention that can be applied by anybody and, and really should be. And that's another thing that's great to break through with this field that you know, we all work in. When you look at things not just as sick versus healthy, there's a lot more ability to get through to people who might feel those things are stigmatized. 
And so we sort of arrived at these three areas of what an app could look like after a hell of a lot of discussion and, and testing things out and wireframing and all sort of stuff. And we looked at this idea of um, discovering what one's values are and also then understanding what that really means in the context of your life and then doing stuff in a real practical sense to base your actions and your life more upon those values. And so to begin with the discovery component of the Spark app, or as we call it, Reflect, revolves around questions and answers. And it looks a lot better than this. This is just the, the back end of it. I don't want to peel back the lace and show you. So what we did, again, in this multidisciplinary setting was we write a whole lot of questions that people can answer and we provide many, many possible answers for multiple choice. The, the user would only be presented with four of these at a time. But um, the challenge in this really is to, to get something that Schwartz has created in terms of a, a questionnaire and turn it into something that's actually sort of human, not so researchy. We find often like, well, I find the way these things are written don't always really gel with um, the average common person. So um, that was a huge part of it, which in itself is quite a, quite a big task in dealing with so many questions and so many answers. But the next part of that is to then um, align each of these answers with that whole circle, that whole spectrum of um, the values within the domains. And so that becomes, that, that's really where the idea of having the psychology side and the creative writing side and the design side all really merges together and we have to work side by side and all that stuff. So you basically, we basically went through a single answer and added value, as in numerable values, to um, the values in the categories. and. Um, sort of went more and more and more across all of those um, those 50 and at a certain point it kind of gets a bit ridiculous um, which I would hope was that point um, but it sort of wasn't even that <laughs> it's just going to be even bigger and um, we, we've just recently kind of gotten to a point where through that process and we have um, a, a viable product now. The understanding component is uh, what we call Spark itself. We present a visual representation of what your values are which adapted this and made it look a bit more like this, a bit more user-friendly and interesting and fun and, and tactile. And, um, and you can see in that centerpiece there, those, those broader um, rays represent the domains themselves, whereas the smaller ones represent the individual values, and they shrink and grow depending on um, uh, what your values are. And so the other part of this process was translating the more technical or uh, more researcher, I say research e that's a word I decided to exist now, um, into um, words that might seem less judgmental, or might seem a bit more friendly, or a bit more relatable. And the same thing is true with the descriptions. Um, sometimes they just sort of didn't have a lot to them. I think there was a sort of not a real a lot of heart in these things, so um, a lot of that process was really bringing that out. Um, and this was across the board in all of our descriptions, um, all of the category names, all of the values themselves, and um, just really understanding what uh, a user might think and feel in, in using this app. Um, again, don't read all of this because it's way too much to, to digest, but um, I just wanted to share with you this one little part of this content creation journey as well, where um, part of the app, which I'll show you in a moment, um, that describes uh, how your values fit into your life um, merges the, the top two domains that relate to you and smashes them together and has all the areas of your life that fits into which requires um, getting every single one of those ten and matching it to each individual one which I didn't actually count how much that was but it was a lot. Um, we worked with an agency on this which is great there, um, an agency in, in Surrey Hills called Nomad um, and Traditionally, an agency would usually do a lot of the design, conceptualization stuff as well for the development. Um, but thankfully, we had a lot of those resources in house as well. So, Nomad did a lot of the development, focus more on the development stuff in their fancy, awesome office. Um, wouldn't it be nice if that would, yeah, they have like decks and a bar and like so many great distractions? Um, <laughs> we, uh, we used um, some collaboration tools which we found very, very useful for. All of, and this actually came from, from Matt, our internal designer, um, for us and for the agency uh, to collaborate on the app as it was being developed. So every little piece of it 
that would be changed, uh, conceptualized, we'd all be able to comment on it and, um, and shape it together. And sometimes you, you get feedback from the most interesting places. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but sometimes I kind of lean a bit more on that air and say, what about this around here, and, and vice versa. Um, I just wanted to show you that I'm Sting from The Simpsons uh, framework. Like <laughs> um, <laughs> not relevant, but important to me. Um, and so again, just looking at, um, uh, looking at how uh, we collaborate and comment on the image of the poem. I am very thankful that we have enough time today to show you the app. So if you don't mind, that's exactly what I'll do now. It's the magic of technology. So so each of those domains, there were ten domains, and each of those domains comprises five values that reflect that domain. They're different values. So that's 50 altogether, and that spreadsheet that he was showing you means that we have to go through every single answer and actually endorse which values that each answer did on those 50, the, the spreadsheet of the 50. So it's, it's, it was big actually. So it's like 40,000 cells, is it? So it's, like it's very big, and um, this is what we've been spending a lot of our time doing, but it, it's meticulous work that, you know, you really find very fine grand analysis of how people would actually be interpreting those kind of answers. And of course, I'll talk, I mean, I think yeah. we can talk about the questions, but certainly it needs to be evaluated. Yeah, definitely. So we've got this running live on my device now. And what uh, this begins with is a simple onboarding process to just explain uh, what Spark does and what the components of the app are. So you can see down the bottom that little it just lights up to show the reflect part about the question and answers, uh, the spark itself, and then also the act component. So I've already um, unlocked all of the components, but usually spark and act would be locked to begin with. Um, you can see one of these questions, what would you most want the tagline of your autobiography to be? And each of these answers comes from that pool of 20 randomly selected. And whenever you tap on any one of these, the the scores within those values associated to each answer will increase. Um, you know, I never wrote always Instagram, every time. Um, <laughs> damn. Um, that's my girlfriend's brother, so it's maybe going to keep happening. Um, hopefully we'll get a phone call. That's going to be good. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? What Instagram. Time? Yes, so, <laughs> every time. Um, the three that you don't pick will actually decrease slightly from your, from your overall score. So in this case, I'm obviously going to say letting my hair down. Um, if you could redo the last 10 years, what would you do differently? Um, yeah, it has to be party harder. Which animal would you want to identify with? So all of these things you can see um, are, are building toward a profile. And as much as we can, we try to make these um, as, as natural and human as possible. And what we found in getting people to test this already is that they often spend so much time just really thinking about the questions and answers. Sort of a lot. More. We originally thought maybe it's just like a bridge to get into displaying the spark and doing the acts, but it seems like this part itself can be very therapeutic, quitting work. Um, so I'll just kind of skip through a few of these, and we'll just look at what my spark, my hypothetical spark, looks like. So. This um, represents the values and the domains that they live in. And what we can do, which is really quite cool, if we just tap into here, we can actually move our spark around. And you can see on the right, those little domains just pop up and turn white there. And you can tap on any of these to get more information about it. So in this case, relaxation is just chilling out, focusing on spending time doing the things that are peaceful, and that ease and attention is important to me. Um, and that's across the board. All of them have these, these custom written um, descriptions. Um, but where it gets really useful is that if we just zoom out again uh, and we scroll down a bit, you can see the top two areas, the two domains that are um, relevant to us, and also the individual, the three individual values, which can come from different domains. Um, and then what we do is um, to just tap down and look at these areas of your life. Um, this is that custom written stuff of combining those two domains together, which is pretty easy to write when they're two adjoining values, when they're you know benevolence and power. It's like who what? Um, so thankfully the interns are very helpful with that. Um, 
different areas, family, friends, relationships, work, personal life, and then also eventually looking at what celebrities, what public figures also would have those two categories combined. The final section that I want to show you before we jump into doing some Q&A stuff is the act section. Now, at the moment, this is more just placeholder stuff. We are working on developing more of a, a, a bridge to, to take you from your spark into actually really implementing this stuff in a practical sense. Um, and each of these acts will be based on your values. For now, being a placeholder, these acts um, aren't tied to any values. They're kind of just in a pool there. But the way it works, just for demonstration purposes, is um, to um, present something that's um, a small, it's not kind of saying quit your job and leave your wife, it's kind of just saying here's little things that you can do. So, for example, if it was, you know, it's, it's family is and belonging is very important to you, it might be something like, you know, read to your kids or whatever it might be. So, you can just say done when you've done that. Um, or in the case where you need to make the time to do things, um, you can just set a little reminder. Um, if you don't want to do it right now, it can come back to you later. Um, and uh, that's just a, a very uh, preliminary part of this platform, but something that we're hoping to expand a hell of a lot more. It really just comes down to, to uh, funding, really, to make this more of a social platform that we can connect more to each other and all that sort of stuff. So we really see this being um, potentially huge, and this could be a thing where um, companies can use this to form teams rather than just based upon personality typing. It's really more about what people find important to them as individuals and the meaning behind those whys. So, that is um, actually the end of that demonstration. And uh, if you'd like, we'd be quite happy to um, jump into a bit of Q&A in just a moment. Before we do though, I just wanted to give you a few thoughts on, on what's gonna happen next. Me plugging this thing in is the first step. Um, so next we're, um, we're developing more marketing materials around to help people um, understand how it's useful and why. I'm going to be looking at getting funding from elsewhere and as Vigil just mentioned in a moment, um, what we're hoping to do in terms of evaluation as well. So that's it for now guys. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we have a bit of time. We've got, um, what is it, 14 minutes of yes. Q&A? So that's pretty much bang on, isn't it? Um, so thank you very much for listening. Really do appreciate that. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to just yell it out. It's small enough you don't need to do the hands thing. So, um, to either of us or both of us, anything at all. So, you you focused on values as being the way into what exactly? What is the what are the outcomes that you're principally looking for? Well, I think that, that comes with the acts, yeah, the act section, and this is where we're having, you know, some discussions because part of it is also being more goal directed and working towards things that give you that sense of satisfaction and fulfilment. So recognizing your values would be one the start of it, and the actions that you'll be doing would be things that are concordant with those and concordant with where you want to be. So we have that's that's a big piece, and we're. That's, those are the things that we need to do. So yes, it is moving in a direction that is concordant with your values. We take into account, I mean, this, the part of all of this thinking also takes into account the, the fact that there are limitations to how much you can work towards your values or, or be goal-driven that are directly related to your values, because it depends on what other competing things are happening in your life. So you, you may not have the time or the space or the finances or whatever, to do whatever it is that you want to do. So it's a recognition also of where you're at and where you want to be. I'm sorry if it sounds vague, but that's, <laughs> that's in, a, in a nutshell, really. Um, yeah. and, and is there evidence, for mm. example, that this approach mm. via values mm. is more powerful than other approaches to increasing well-being, if that's the generic outcome? Yeah, so how yeah. does it compare with resilience training, yeah, yeah. Uh, character strengths, mindfulness, whatever else? Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, the research hasn't, has not been done like but, that. But you chose but, to look at values because you believed that was the we, most... We believed it, and we also mapped it onto... Uh, there, there is quite a lot of literature on goal setting, goal setting and um, you know, short and long-term goals and how that actually improves people's, well, mood and also their sense of, of satisfaction, I suppose, with what they're doing because they're more targeted. So we saw the values as, as sort of linked up with 
how would you choose your goals, where are you heading? So this is the part of the act section that we need to um, flesh out. But it's going to be within the scope of what we can do, obviously. Um, so we're, we're, I guess we're also debating what would be the end point, exactly your point, Felicia, in terms of what would be the end point, where do we let go of people? Do we just set people on the course of self-discovery and set them on a course of discovering or discovering their values, setting goals for themselves and working towards what they personally think is important with a view that, yes, those goals could change, values over a long period of time, depending on other competing things, could change as well, or do we set sort of final goals and get them to work on this program on Spark for, for a very, very long period of time, guiding them right through. We haven't yet finished that, you know. but yeah, it is based on, I suppose, on the goal setting type of literature. I guess we also, part of the, uh, the people that we've consulted are people in coaching psychology, so some of that is obviously infiltrating this work. Yeah, so it's a good question. And it is, we have a, a backlog, like, bigger than that scoring sheet almost of what we want to do with this and, and where we believe this can head and um, a lot of that really is just taking chance of that we see is going to be most useful to our users and um, working out how to implement that obviously with the, the time and resources so um, I mean, this what you've seen today is actually just began as a proof of concept it's just sort of a, a um, prototype that I just throw out afterwards and rewrite so I think actually with, with not a lot of uh, resources and money. It's a very small team. We've done, we've done quite a lot. So um, this is just going to get bigger and, and better as, as we go on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, up the back, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the factor analysis of uh, the scales uh, yes. did not produce anything resembling uh, or something similar to what uh, the model, the circumflex uh, model is showing. What oh. factors, how many factors do you get? Uh, uh, what are they? No, no, the, 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 the factor analysis did, I mean, that, that the circle, the, the uh, 10 factors there, are exactly from the factor analysis. That, that part is, is, uh, is exactly the same. The questionnaires that were used to derive those, those factors, some of the, the, the number of questions or the number of values within each of those domains vary between three and six. Most of the average was five. So there were only like, I don't know, three or four that maybe had uh, not five, but, but the majority had five. So where the, they were high, where, where the, the, the values mapped onto that factor were, were sound, we used it directly. If they didn't, we looked at that very carefully and then tried to extrapolate as to what would be, what would extend that to say there was th only three items or three values. What other two could, would we think would be fitting into that? Given given Schwartz's description, how he was actually conceptualising that particular factor. So we work very hard with his very long descriptions and the bigger descriptions yeah. than the I've used the scale myself. Mm. And oh, it's usually, it's usually yeah. two factors that I get. And they are highly correlated as yes, well. Yes. Uh, so uh, uh, I was just wondering what okay. is your, so yeah. perhaps when you take ten factors you can rotate it. Eh? Yes. And yes. It's really okay. I mean we we've used his direct um, yeah. study. Yeah, the circumplex. Yeah, yeah, the circumplex, that's right. Yeah, the circumplex yes. model, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, we use that. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh, yes, in the yeah, the middle. Yeah. <laughs> oh sorry, I mean, I'm yeah. sorry, but um, make sure you. Oh, now I feel I awkward. Uh, now I'm aware of you. Yeah, that's you first. Yeah. So I had a question about the app itself. Uh -huh. um, if I understood correctly, the options are they come up at random from like the whole list of mm. responses. Um, but there are 50 values. So do all of the responses map onto at least one? Like, is there at least one time when it maps onto each of those values? Yeah, actually it's a really interesting question, one that, that we had to think very carefully about in our content creation process because, I mean, one approach could be just to make sure that you arrive at the same uh, level of possibilities, uh, oh, so the same like equal weighting across all the values and all the questions and answers, um, which is really what we want to give it a fair chance. Um, but if you start with that and just try to force every single answer to fit, you're probably going to get some really clunky things that people probably wouldn't 
really answer in, in, in the positive form. Um, so the approach we took was to really just write all the questions and answer, sort of like a family feud type thing. It's like, look what comes out and what's relatable. Um, and then we map the values onto them. And then we look at where the gaps are, um, where values, certain values aren't represented as much, and we write more content to fill it in to make it equal. And, yeah. and there's, there's also the, the other thing that we've, what we've done is, in the algorithm, the program actually, you, you, get a, a, you get your values based on what you endorsed, but also what you didn't endorse, because mm -hmm. that's got a negative weighting, a small or negative weighting. So it kind of really um, pulls out the, the values that you have actually endorsed. Mm -hmm. And we also require to answer a certain number of questions before the spark itself is unlocked or it can be displayed. And then after that process, you answer more and more and more and more and more. A little bar talks that shows how, uh, what percentage of accuracy it is. So you have to answer quite a lot yeah. to get to that level. So, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it. When you use, are you using the Likert scale for, for your statements or using? No, it's just, it's just a. Are you using no, it? Schwartz's, Schwartz's way where he's, yes, he has two negative like values it's in it, yeah. which will give you some of that information. So, so the way we do it is, is, you know, you saw the question comes up and then you just get a forced choice. You can just make a choice, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so, and we try to make it as, you know, as, as fun for people, as engaging for people, even though the algorithm behind it would be a little bit more serious, obviously. But, but the, the actual answers could be quite, at times, frivolous, almost. We have these set of origin guys at the back. Maybe uh, <laughs> Queensland can <laughs> <to> get me. <moving. laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the taste of things to come. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 was I, I was thinking about the interrelationship between your values as developers and the users' values when it comes to the act part. So, like, if a user on, I like security, I like power, I like achievement. Mm -hmm. Do you okay. tell me to go kick a puppy or something? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's actually a really interesting point because it's so interesting. We've found through doing this that across our team and the institute, yeah, it is harder to, uh, under our principles of having create content, certain ones are harder to write in a positive light. <laughs> it's like, how do you make, like, you know, power and uh, uh, a good thing? Um, we, we found that we are aligned in certain ways. But the sort of the point of it is that, you know, you might have some big chunks of alignment, but then just a real outlier, and that's what I think is quite interesting. So, in writing the content, um, we draw upon a lot of different people to do that. Um, and that's a pretty important part of it. I don't think we kicking puppies was considered, but we had to scrap that. Um, yeah, no. It, so the, the idea though is that what you'll be recommended um, as part of ACT is something that will simply put what you do more in line with what your values are. And um, I guess with that, we haven't sort of written a small placeholder content for now. Um, that certainly will be tricky, but what we need to do right now is focus on just getting it right and, and evaluating that to make sure it's tight. Um, but yeah, that will be a fun process, actually, I think. <laughs> um, but in any, in any case, the. The idea is that it's not judging the person to say that power is. It seems to be always the one that comes up, um, or even hedonism. It's not to say that's uh, that's a bad thing. It's not about trying to change your values. Uh, it's about working toward utilizing them. Yeah, and New South Wales, and then yeah. and then so, yeah. And then your blacks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the kitchen club. Is this? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the most manly football team in the world. Uh, yeah, sorry. Anyway. I just had a couple of quick observations. One was. Um, like, did you think about different domains of people's lives as well? Like, in the sense in which you might have certain kind of things that are important to you at work that might be quite different, for example, in your leisure time or, you know, with children versus with your friends or whatever. I just mm -hmm. wondered whether, I mean, obviously you can't do everything. Um, another question that occurred to me is um, how much you thought about giving people free choice versus forced choice? Because I, I wonder kind of about that. Like. Seeing your circ circumflex, whatever it's called, yeah. I could immediately think of a couple that would be important to me that I couldn't almost see there. And they may be there somewhere hidden, but yeah. I just wondered whether about that yeah. force versus free choice. Well, yeah, I mean, with, the, with that second point, Nick maybe can answer the question. Yeah. But the, the, on the second point, even Schwartz actually says that he found that in some cultures they did actually endorse 
other values that would not have been across the board, but, but the ones we've, he's chosen are the ones that were the cross cultural, and that's that's where we've decided to go. But one of one of the ones that came up actually yesterday when we were doing some of the coding was spirituality, which actually isn't there. And it's subsumed under some of the other values rather than being on its own, which in short says did come up in some cultures, but not in others. But it was it was variable. So yes, it's a good point. I mean we have to make a call, basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we chose mm -hmm. this. But just to, the, the to answer thing. that first question before before we go to this one, um there's a couple of ways to answer that, I think. Um, to begin with, we do take some profiling questions at the beginning to better tailor what questions and answers are delivered to the user. So we ask uh, if they're from a rural or remote region or not, um, if they have kids or if they don't, or if they're over or under 25. So maybe, uh, oh, sorry, a student, and, and also um, if you're in employment or not. So um, these sort of things allow us to give them the right questions and answers that are appropriate. You wouldn't be you know, ask about your kids if you don't have them. Um, but also potentially with the act stuff as well, to kind of say you wouldn't be told to read to your kids um, if you don't have them, um, which makes a lot of sense. Um, as far as the free choice stuff goes though, looking at the difference in, in your example between work and home, I mean really your values um, are part of you and don't change wherever you are, but I mean perhaps that could just theorize, perhaps that could speak of why a lot of people aren't satisfied in their work because other people really choose what they spend their time doing and that's not how we like their values. So the, the purpose of this is to enable individuals and um, and uh, and workplaces to, to help people do that more. Example, um, Matt, our designer, actually worked in a different job for an agency um, and then in the early stage of us creating Spark, looked at his own values and was like, hang on, I don't want to be doing commercial work for an agency. Left the agency, worked more on Spark, founded his own startup agency that worked just with social good causes and his, his first one was matching mentors to mentees. So it can really be, I mean, it can be pretty big dramatic changes and um, doesn't always have to be, but um, the free choice probably comes more in um, selecting which um, act things you want to do and which ones you don't. Yeah, uh, to you. Yeah, two questions. The, other, the second one you sort of halfway answered. Um, the rationale for what you're doing is heavily dependent upon uh, the psychometric model that I uh, decided with. Have you done the uh, testing of the psychometrics and uh, the factors analysis, but also the circumflex model and how well that works with the, the items that you're actually using? Because that would be a real complicated uh, analysis because you've got the, the forced choice, so there's an ipsative sort of quality to all the items and so forth. Uh, have, have you done that? Have you got any? Have you got any uh, publications or reports or uh, anything like that in relation to that, because I would, I would find that real interesting. Yeah. I certainly don't. No, but, um, <laughs> what about you? I mean, that's, I think that's, is there stuff that, that can be drawn? I mean, is there, is, does that exist out there? This is exactly what we need to do for the next stage. Yes. So we actually have a postdoc starting up in September, and his job will be to actually do that. That is exactly what, what he's going to be doing. So we need to validate the, um, the you know, what people endorse against what perhaps we think they're endorsing. And we also need to make sure that, um, well, we need to make sure that they're stable. I mean, there's a whole bunch of psychometrics that needs to be done. But yes, we need to do that. And the other thing we, we want to do also is some sort of uh, evaluation of its efficacy or effectiveness. Um, but again, he, he doesn't start until September, and we're still in the process of trying to work out what we're going to do with the acts. So yeah, so um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So it was a bit of a chicken and egg type thing because you, you couldn't do do the evaluation until you had this. So you needed this first, and then you could do the evaluation. So we are going to do it here. Yeah. And that's and I understand it's an interactive uh, kind of process. And yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, I guess the other aspect. Uh, was the the acts? I mean, uh, it would seem to me that if you're doing generic acts on an app, that they're going to be pretty superficial. They're not. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. to get the real meaningful kind yes. of change that you're talking about, it's almost like a therapeutic. Yeah. Kind of yes. process. Totally. That's yeah. exactly. And, uh, exactly. That's what we. How do you move from? 
fairly soon. You know, some of the things that you're going to be suggesting may make sense in relation to what you're talking about the domains, but that may not might not make sense at all in relation to the personnel. I understand that you can get some of that with the profiling, uh, so that'll give you some gross. Yeah, uh, yeah, our selection yeah, yeah. Uh, of acts, but beyond that. Yeah, it's not just the profile, so I'm sorry, mm. I'm talking about the other bit. Um, yeah, yeah, true. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, so, we're still, so all of this, these are all the ideas, and it's all in development, and remember, we're, we're trying to do this in between the other stuff that we're doing, so it's a little bit slow, and it goes in fits and starts, but one of the things that we were talking about was that, you see, when you answer those questions, we don't actually know why people are answering those questions. I mean, when you answer, say, you know, what would your, uh, I don't know, your, the most famous person that you'd like to meet or whatever, why you actually endorse that person. So what we've actually talked to Matt uh, Devoco about is perhaps some of those questions, apart from the demographics, would actually lead into other questions, but to the user, it would just look like they're just answering questions. On the interface, it just looks like they're just answering the same, you know, just questions that keep coming up. But we're actually then building a, it's not a profile, but it's a, a background of the motivations that underlie some of those reasons why they're picking what they're picking, and that's what the acts are actually going to be based on. So it's not, they're not generic. Mm. Yeah. And the other part of that I'll, I'll throw in there is that that act part is, is the least fleshed out of what we've got yeah. so far. Okay. It really is more just a placeholder, and currently those things I said are not actually mapped behind the scenes to the values, they certainly will be soon. To use your imagination, I mean, I think if you, if you can look at what the app has, you've got users who have a better understanding of what their values are, and then what, I mean, it could be, uh, or it could be anything from recommending different e-health interventions, it could be reading particular books, it could be connecting with certain people through social media, it could be so many different things. The possibilities really are endless, and this is just the very first step of that. And just the example that you gave is, you're catching. You've got this wonderful person who has quit his job yes. and uh, uh, done completely. Now, I, I don't assume that you're going to have uh, one of your axes quit your job. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very, very important. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the idea, again, of all these acts is um, to usually be smaller steps leading towards mm -hmm. something that we certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't ask for no, dramatic changes. But, but sometimes but, 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 there's a long way. <laughs> Yeah, superficial acts that are consistent with your oh, values. Yeah. To, yeah. So yeah. And what we're hoping to do is yeah. get some user generated content to have yeah. people to write in to say what they found really yeah. helpful and then utilize that stuff and give out to other people. So, mm. yeah, a lot of potential there. That takes us to time though. Do you have any more? Oh, sorry, do we have another one? No? It's an echo from the past. Oh, okay. um, if you have any, I mean, we can share our email addresses. Yes, yes. Yeah? yeah. I'm only a black dog for one more day after today, so. It's a very uh, good reply. Yeah. Um, no, but we, I can so I can so give my other email address yeah. to as well. So thank you so much for having us and for listening. Really appreciate your time. Cheers. Thank you.